Uh, today uh, is Lab 7. We're going to talk about uh, decision trees, uh, uh, implementing decision trees, random forest, and ensemble methods. I'm actually going to sort of uh, review uh, decision trees and uh, random forests uh, a bit. Um, but I'm mostly going to concentrate on the, uh, on the actual uh, detailed implementation. So um, I guess, so oh, uh, I'm, I'm referencing a lot of uh, stuff in the in Introduction to Statistical Learning. Uh, I think that's a great book if, you, um, if you're interested in more methods that you can, you can learn or you can use to learn uh, to make uh, classifiers as well as regressions, uh, regression type things. Um, so if you're, if you're, I, I, I would highly recommend that you read it. Uh, there's a few sections in there. In particular, chapter uh, eight is about decision trees uh, and and regression trees. Um, and uh, so I would recommend that you read that. Uh, but I'm going to go over some basic concepts here. <laughs> okay. So first, uh, this this stuff we've seen um, a lot of the the optimize uh, as well as the do classify. This is from the previous labs. And so these are written very generically that you can do any kind, or like a, lo a lot of different kinds of classifiers and any kind of classifiers from sklearn. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to just sort of uh, read them in here. And uh, I made a little plotting function uh, similar to, to before, but this is for uh, plotting uh, trees with uh, two covariates. Uh, just so we can get a, get an idea of what these look like in practice. Okay, so um, so th this this the data we'll be working with is actually was used in uh, in a homework a few years ago. Uh, this is the uh, there's a wine data set, um, and so we can read it in. There's there's actually I mentioned this last time or in a few labs ago that there's this gigantic repository of uh, of data sets. That are that's provided by UC Irvine, um, and this is one of them. Uh, so this one, what it is, is is uh, is is a bunch of wines. There's a total of uh, let's see, uh, 1,600 wines, and there are uh, physical measurements uh, on each each wine. So every row is a wine, and in the end, there's a quality score. You see it there. So that one, this one got a five, and they're out of uh, I believe ten. Um, so there's things like acidity, uh, uh, residual sugar. These are all just uh, actual physical measurements uh, on the wine. And the, the idea here is going to be, so actually, if we look at it, here's, the, here's what the data actually looks like. This is the, uh, the score that they got. So you see there's a lot of fives and sixes. It's actually out of eight, or there's only eight. But you see there's, there's very few really good wines. There's a lot of. Uh, decent wines, and there's a few really bad ones too. So uh, in this in this lab, what we're going to be interested in is being able to classify the good wines. Uh, so so that we're going to take it to be uh, it's either a seven or an eight. That means it's a good wine. Otherwise, it's a bad wine. It's probably not bad, but that's what we're going to call it. Okay. So. Um, uh, here I'm just going to grab the names, the column names for the, for the, uh, uh, the covariates here, for the predictors. We're going to use them as predictors. Okay, so um, one thing that we talked about last time in, in one of the labs, in the last lab, actually, is this uh, the evaluation me metrics. I want to bring that back uh, really quickly because um, we, if we notice that, I mean, obviously there are very few good wines. There's only actually 13%. Uh, good wines you see here, so this is only 13% of the uh, of all the wines. Uh, so using a metric like uh, accuracy is not necessarily going to be the best thing to do here. Um, and so if you just go back to the previous lab, or I'll just remind you now that actually a better score might be this uh, this the thing that they call F1 score, which is the uh, harmonic mean of re recall and precision, which is basically trying to balance. Uh, um, misclassification when you have unbalanced uh, outcomes. So here we have 13% uh, that are ones and uh, like 70 something percent that are bad wines. Okay, so um, the sorry the in do classify there's actually a score function argument and you can you can you can give it uh, any function. There's there's a bunch of them actually. 
And uh, so if you just go into the documentation here, you'll see there are a lot of different classification metrics. They're all f four different things, but he today we'll, we'll use the uh, F1 metric. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind whenever you're, whenever you're uh, dealing with classification of unbalanced um, outcomes. Okay. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is actually decision trees. So they, they cover decision trees in class uh, to, some with, uh, to some detail. And I just want to go over another example just really quickly. If someone gave you a tree, how do you use it? Okay, so you have a new observation. Someone gave you this tree, and these are the predictions that they... So this is uh, for the uh, Titanic, actually. Um, so they, they built a, a, a classification tree to be able to predict whether or not someone was going to survive or they were going to die. And uh, so you... Let's say you're given a new person, uh, and you want to predict whether or not this person would have died. Well, what you, what you would ask first is you would say, are they male or female? Well, if they're female, then they probably survived, right? And if they're male, you go down the tree. Okay, then the next question is, is the person older than nine and a half years? If the, if the answer is yes, then they're male, and they're older than 9.5 years, and they probably died. Um, if, they're, if they're young, meaning if they're under nine, nine and a half years, then you ask the question, well, do they have, uh, how many siblings do they have? And if they had more than two and a half siblings, or if they had three, four, five siblings, they probably died. Okay, so that's how you use this uh, in, in order to predict. Um, so that's if someone gives you a tree, and you can use it to predict. But, I mean, it is, well, I actually put this joke, and I actually, if, uh, is it good for anything other than being able to tell you what was going to happen at the end of the movie, uh, which, Always, I always think about this whenever I see an example on the Titanic. It's like they could have really survived. There's no reason for that. Okay, but um, more seriously, uh, how do we actually find? How do we actually fit decision trees? So, um, in terms of uh, of of, pre of predict uh, of classification, it's very it's very uh, easy. Um, so. What you do is you have a list of covariates. So in our example, we have wine, we have the acidities, we have sugar content, we have alcohol content, we have all these predictors, and then we have labels. We have whether the wine is good or not. And the way that the tree is built is you first assign the, the label 1 or 0 to all of the observations. And then you calculate the sum of squared errors, which is this thing. We've seen this before in the, in the, uh, in the regression context. Um, but basically, this is just going to be how many am I going to get wrong? Um, and in this case, you'll get a bunch wrong because you labeled them all ones and we know that the majority are zeros. And then at each step of the algorithm, you just basically uh, br br you, you, you write a gigantic list of possible decisions, of possible splits up here. And then you, uh, this, is, this doesn't actually happen in practice, but this is how you want to think about it, is that of all the possible decisions, um, you can make a new prediction based on that, on that node. So, um, so the way it works is here in this example, so for each decision, let's say that the decision was x10 is greater than 12, so something like alcohol content is greater than 12%. Um, is that, does that make sense for wine? I don't think wine has over 12%. Anyway, okay. Um, so, so uh, for that decision, we can say, okay, we'll set y is equal to 1 if, if the wine, uh, if the alcohol content is bigger than 12% and 0 otherwise. So that's, a, that's a, the first split of a tree. And then we can recalculate for that particular split the error. And so we can do that for all, all the proposed splits. And the split that, that uh, provides the, uh, the smallest uh, or the, the most reduction in error, we're going we're gonna to take that split. And in that way, uh, you, can, you can build a tree like this. And then we know, I mean, you've seen this plot before in lecture, that the tree actually corresponds to, this is for two covariates, it actually corresponds to splitting up the uh, predictor space like that. So in this case, uh, we would have at the end either predicted 0 or predicted 1. Um, and so that's sort of uh, how it works. And uh, so, 
let's actually um, let's actually let's actually do this, uh, and we can do it in scikit-learn fairly easily. Um, first, let's do a train a test train split um, like we always do because we want to know in the end um, how uh, how we how how we do uh, on a new on a new uh, set of wines that we haven't seen yet. Um, so, but first, let's just sort of check that, make sure that nothing went wrong here. So, uh, the, the the percentage of good wines in the training and testing is about the same. So that's that's good. Uh, sometimes you'll end up because there are so few uh, good wines, you'll end up with a ton of them in your training set and, and not as many in your testing set. So you always want to check this, especially for the unbalanced cases. Okay. So um, we're using the do classify function, uh, the same that we that we have been. Um, in the last few labs on machine learning, and uh, so so uh, in, in SK Learn there's uh, there's a tree uh, module, and in, and uh, we can instantiate a, a, a decision tree um, uh, like this, and then we we basically pass it the exact same way that we have before, um, except here notice that when it when it asks for the score function, I'm actually going to give it a new score function. I'm not going to use the default. The default is accuracy. So we talked about that before. Um, so I want to sort of point out a few things. So decision trees have a bunch of parameters that you can tune. Um, and so if you go to the help page, you'll actually see a lot of parameters. Um, and, and I've gone through them, and uh, I decided that I actually want to tune two. Um, I want to tune um, the depth of the tree. So that is how far down in levels am I willing to go? Um, and so it, it's, it's an up to parameter. So uh, if I say it's five, it can go down to up to five levels. So one, two, three, four, five. Um, and uh, so that's the max depth parameter. And then the min samples leaf. So this cryptic name is actually for uh, let's see where it is here. So the minimum uh, number of samples required to split an internal node. So that is essentially uh, deciding, if you're here, say, if you're here and you want to decide whether or not you're going to split on this covariate, in order to split, you need, you, this, this requirement is saying, I need at least uh, n number of samples that are going to go to either one. So you don't want to create leaves that are basically one observation. So it prevents overfitting. Um, okay, so we can look at, we can just uh, run this uh, to do a parameter like cross-validation search the way we've uh, been doing, and we end, up, we end that, uh, that, uh, that the optimal thing is to say, oh, um, that the max depth is, tr is three, and the min uh, samples uh, is one. Okay, so... Um, what does this actually look like? Oh, another thing is that I ran this for two covariates. I ran it for the alcohol content and the fixed acidity. And uh, so I just picked those two uh, just, to, just so that we can actually look at what the tree, uh, what did I do? Did I not run that? So this is what the, the decision boundaries look like. So it looks a little faded on this. Um, I really should have maybe changed the colors from last time. But uh, you might be able to see on, on, um, on your lab uh, that there's a decision boundary here, and there's another decision boundary here. And what that's saying is trying to capture all the blue dots within each decision boundary. So it actually really went overboard here. This is what uh, that one min leaf. Uh, that's what it was saying is actually trying to capture this 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 leaf here, here or this uh, data point here, um, and it was trying to capture. Cause you see, most of the blue ones are are about here, um, but we can uh, again. Um, so, but if we look at the, I mean, w one of the issues is 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 the overfitting uh, issue. So it 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 fit the tree basically to this point. 
right? So that decision boundary was decided by this single point. So if I actually look at my test data, uh, you'll see that there's no other points there. Um, so this decision boundary is not that great. Um, but we can, we can play around with other decision boundaries to see, or sorry, with, with other possible searches. Uh, because here we searched for all the leaves, uh, the min sample leaves, we, we allowed this overfitting. So maybe if we actually say, oh, no, no, you need, actu you need f at least four, right? What would that give us? All right. All right, so, um, so this actually gave us the exact same fit. So this actually gives us the same fit. Maybe the depth. Anyway, so what I was trying to get at is that if you do uh, different types of, uh, of tree searches, um, you'll end up with different looking trees. That's all. Um, this is really strange. OK. Well, you can fiddle around with, with that. It's basically just doing a cross-validation to try to find the, uh, the best uh, predictor. Um, but one thing, I, one thing we should actually try is instead of just using two predictors, to use all of the predictors. And um, so one thing I actually haven't been looking at is this, uh, this confusion matrix. Uh, in the previous examples, we had, um, we had uh, this, this confusion matrix, you see this overfitting uh, issue. Uh, the overfitting is, is seen from looking at, uh, at how much this drops uh, between the training and the testing. And so it is kind of overfitting the data there. Um, and in this example, it's a little bit better. There's more covariates. Uh, there's more ways for the tree to be built. It's not just built on two. Uh, so here's, here's, the, here's the accuracy and here's the confusion matrix. So the problem before was that it was just being built with two covariates, but now we have we have uh, eleven covariates. Okay. So um, so you can feel free to play around with that a little bit. There's uh, there's a lot um, a lot of things you could do. There's many more options that you can uh, try to tune. Those are the two main ones. Um, okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is random forest. So they uh, they covered that a little bit, and they're going to cover it a bit more today. Um, so if you're watching live, you'll be able to see it next. Um, but here's a little preview then. Um, so random forests are kind of an interesting idea. Um, so basically, uh, one of the hardest parts of fitting decision trees is, uh, is fitting them. There's a lot of data to be, to be uh, there's a lot of things to be calculated. And uh, if you use all your data, this, these things can take a while. And um, this, was, this was especially true back in the 90s. Um, now it's a little bit less true, but it's still, it's still true if you have a lot of data. Uh, so, one, so the first step in, in to building to random forests is this idea of bootstrap aggregation. Um, it's like ba it's, they call it bagging or tree bagging. Um, uh, strange. OK. Um, but basically, the idea is you take a random subsample of your data. So you just, take, you just take a chunk of it at random. You build a classification tree like you did on that subsample only. And now you have a tree. And they're, they're, uh, so the bootstrapping is this idea of just taking a, a small amount at random. Um, and, and then you do it again and again and again. And by the end, you'll have a bunch of trees. So you'll have, say, 100 trees. And then if you have a new data point to predict, all you have to do is basically run your point down the tree, see where it lands. That's your prediction. And then you do it again for the next tree and the next tree and the next tree. And then you take a majority vote uh, for classification, or you take an average for, uh, for regression. And, and that's, that's the basic idea. So um, it, it's great, because you don't, you don't need to do this for your entire, uh, d with your entire data set. You don't need to build one tree. Not only that, but the um, the, it, this randomness sort of, uh, I don't know how to say this, it makes things generally better when you induce some randomness and, uh, um, and then take uh, averages, which is like a majority vote is kind of like an average. 
Um, so how does this lead to random forests? Okay, so um, so the problem with with bootstrap aggregation is that if you take if you build your tree on all of your covariates, most trees will look the same. All right, so that's that's just sort of one of the problems. Even though your data is different because they're hopefully similar enough to each other, the trees will look very similar. And um, and so what that means is that when you take a when you take this average or majority vote, you're not actually uh, taking an average because all of the all of the predictions are kind of related to each other; they're correlated. And so one way to fix that is to just add this next add this add a new step. So we do the same thing. We take a random subsample of, a da of the data, and then we randomly select a subset of predictors that we're going to use to build the tree. So instead of using all the covariates, you're just going to use a random subset of them. You decide how many, uh, uh, so as long as it's less than, than the total number of your predictors, it does, does show improvements. And so it, in a sense, adds variety to your classifiers. It makes the trees look different from one another and function differently. And in that way, um, when, you do, uh, when you do the majority voting, that's, they're less correlated uh, votes and they're less correlated predictors. And, um, and you have better, um, uh, better uh, uh, results. Um, so you can do this easily, again, just using the, the uh, random forest classifier. This is from the ensemble, um, ensemble module in sklearn. And uh, so here, again, we, we, we have some parameters to tune. So here is uh, the number of uh, estimators, so the number of trees. Um, and then the max features uh, is, I set it to be a range between one and five. And, um, and so the max features, remember there are 11 total features that we have. Uh, we're going to randomly select either one or two or three or four or five to build these trees. And so if we, if we set it to one, these are called stumps instead of trees because they're just one split. Um, and then if two, then they start being trees. So we can... We can uh, do the classification based on this, and it actually finds that uh, the max number, of, uh, the the best max features is four. So four of the randomly selecting four out of the eleven seems to work best, and um, and seventeen total estimators, meaning seventeen total trees, uh, seem to work the best as well. And um, and here's the uh, so here's another issue. So. Uh, this issue, it, it really comes up with, with methods like this because the, 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 the model is so free to, to do whatever it wants, it basically fits the data perfectly. It fits the training data perfectly, uh, but the test uh, accuracy is, is still um, 90%. So this is definitely uh, overfitting. Um, but one of the great things about this, about this method is, is this uh, idea of relative importance. Um, which they covered in class, I believe. Uh, it's definitely in the lecture slides. So um, this uh, relative importance measure is, is basically what it says, uh, or the way you interpret it is how important is this covariate at predicting uh, quality of wine. So like uh, so the, the, the covariate sulfates is very important. It doesn't give you a direction, unfortunately. It doesn't say it, uh, higher values of sulfates give you better wines or, or worse wines, whatever. Um, it just tells you that it's important. So um, don't um, try not to interpret this actual value here uh, as anything other than relative importance uh, to each other. So in pH balance and fixicity are second, second, uh, secondary um, of importance. OK. So um, that, so the, Random forest and the uh, boosted uh, aggregated trees, so the uh, bagging, um, brought along this idea of, uh, of ensemble learning. And so that's the next topic I want to talk about. Um, so the idea of ensemble learning uh, really took off in the 90s. And um, it, it's essentially, it, it generalized this idea that we did before, is that we are trying to put together a lot of 
not that great classifier. So trees are, are good, but if uh, individually or together they're better, is what we just learned. Um, and so we, we want, or what the goal was to, to generalize this so that if we have a lot of weak classifiers, we can put them together somehow. Uh, how we do it, there's a lot of different ways to put them together. Um, but th this is the general idea. If we try to smash them together to get better predictions, um, that's called, those are called uh, ensemble methods. There are, uh, there's a lot of them. Um, I actually give, so here's the, um, the Wikipedia article on uh, ensemble, or sorry, on uh, Adaboost. So this is one ensemble method. Um, and if you want more details on the method, you can, uh, you can look at this, at this article and they, they give you plenty of details. Not only that, there's also, um, there's also uh, uh, more on ensemble. So I actually link just a little bit below, but I'll get to that uh, in a bit. So the way that, that uh, Adaboost works is it's, it's essentially iteratively weighing your, uh, your samples so that each successive uh, predictor concentrates on the ones that the previous predictor did poorly on. So if, like, let's say the first predictor is just going to be a tree. So we're going to get a bunch of predictions from this tree, and all of the samples that it predicted wrong, I'm going um, to increase their weight so that the next predictor will, um, will uh, will concentrate on that one or, or try to reduce the error for that particular observation more than the others. And so uh, the way that it technically works is you say, okay, first I'm just going to say all the data points have weight 1 over n, meaning they're all equally important. And, um, uh, and so uh, the, 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 uh, this is actually done through the loss function, through the weighted loss. Uh, but we won't go into that. If you want more details, you'll, you'll, uh, you can look at it here. Um, so the first step is to fit the classifier. So in, exa in our example, a tree to all the data uh, by, with the weight uh, wi, meaning treat all the observations equally important. Don't leave anyone behind. Um, and then, then you can test to see whether or not the classifier predicts your, all the data points. So you can actually just run your data through the tree, get the prediction for that particular observation. And then the, the data points that are misclassified, so you know which ones they are because you have both, both the, the prediction and the, the reality, we, we, we update their weight by taking the previous weight and multiplying it by a factor. And this factor is, is just made so that it increases the weight if I misclassified and decreases the weight if I've correctly classified. And so in the next iteration, the weight, this wi, is going to be different for all the observations. Um, and so um, that's the general gist of how it works. Um, there, there are uh, a lot of tuning parameters as well. We're going to concentrate mostly on the, uh, on the number of estimators, the, uh, the, the total number of iterations we go through this, uh, this algorithm. Um, it's defaulted at 50, um, but we're going we're gonna to tune that. Um, so while this is running, um, I wanted to, oh, I wanted to mention this uh, number of jobs thing. So I can, I can run a parallel, uh, so this number of jobs is for parallelization, so it can, things can run faster. Um, so on some computers it doesn't work, and on some, uh, on some computers it does, and on others it doesn't. So if you're getting errors that, um, that you don't see me getting, because you'll see some future warnings, I didn't know they did that. Um, but uh, just change the number of jobs to one. That might be the that might be the issue. Um, so this is this is how you run a, a, a an, an adaptive boost uh, classifier, and um, and so you can so you'll see here that the it decided that the 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 best number of estimators is 30, which is actually kind of troubling because it's at the bottom of our range. Um, maybe we should uh, run this for more values. Um, so anytime you see that, that, that it actually hits your range. Um, so here it's, it's, not at, it's not at the edge. Uh, when it actually hits, hits the edge of your range, you might want to rethink uh, what you're doing because uh, what it's saying is that it might have wanted to go less, but you didn't let it. Um, okay. 
So, um, so this, uh, so you see here, there's a, a 90 90 percent accuracy and then 80 80 percent accuracy on the test data here. Okay. So the other um, the other ensemble uh, classifier that I wanted to just basically run. I'm not going to go through the details, uh, but it's essentially uh, something very similar um, to to Adaboost, except that instead of weighing the weighing the, the observations differently, you, you penalize them by changing the loss for, for a badly classified um, data, data points. Um, but you can, it's the same, it's, it's in the ensemble uh, module. If you want to read more about uh, a, a, a lot of these methods, I would actually uh, first recommend uh, just actually going and checking out that Introduction to Statistical Learning book. It's free, it's online, um, it's through Springer as well, so if you're a university uh, affiliate, you can get access to it. Um, I think this is also a Springer. So this is a much, this is their more advanced version of uh, intro statistical learning, but it provides all the details of, of, of these ensemble methods. Um, I would recommend reading this first, and if that's enough for you, then that's, that's great. And then I also put uh, a few Wikipedia articles here on gradient boosting um, and boosting in general and ensemble learning. Um, so you'll see here there's, there are a, a, a lot of different ensemble methods. Um, but let me go back. Okay. So um, I can run this uh, also for, for the data. Uh, this one's going to take a little bit longer. Um, it's because I'm running actually through a, a pair of, um, um, uh, like, a, uh, I'm, I'm optimizing over two parameters, which is the number of estimators and then the max depth. Max depth is the same as the as the trees. It's because uh, it's using a trees as base classifiers as the very weak learners. Um, so I'm optimizing over that as well. And uh, so um, I wanted to actually show what these different surfaces look like because so. Um, We've seen support vector machines in the past, and we now have seen uh, decision trees. We've seen random forests, and uh, and, a, and a few of the boosting um, ensemble learners. So, um, so what I wanted to show is what these. Uh, oh, blah, blah, blah. Sorry. I misspelled forest, and I and I created a, I corrected it somewhere. <laughs> uh, whoops. I must have uh, eaten up something here. Um, I want to grab the columns. Oh, you've never set a max. Right. Right, the X was the subsetting of these. do this um so it uh, grabbed the uh, uh, the installs are set down there 
Yeah. yeah. So that should give you the top two important columns. So right. I printed out or then maybe the tell us what what's going on. These? Yeah, just just in call. Give us the names of these columns, not an it'll, array. It'll give us the call the Yeah, you want the names, right? Yeah. You want the tiny array because you want to subset it. So you're actually in the arch part, you're not, not getting the right. You're not I getting the name. names. I just had this working. Okay. You can just choose any two and see what it looks like right now. So instead of just doing the arch part, and the column is coming from there. Yeah. That doesn't work, does it? Oh, DF isn't is in the matrix. Okay. Maybe I can just scrap this part because it was the last part. So you can just choose 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 any two names. Mm -hmm. Like right, just choose like pH and remember we had it as pH. Yeah. And uh, sulfates or something? Let me just go up and. Oh. Sulfates in C small A6. So now, now it's missing Y. Well, uh, now we need the, the Y part of this, right? Yeah. Okay. Now I need to turn this into a, um, an array. It, it, it's got values, right? So this is what uh, this is what debugging looks like. No, zeros, one. ones. That's right. And then the dot values. Yeah, that should give you the right thing. Now. Yeah, this is. Um, y is not defined. Oh, maybe here. Uh, in C is equal to Y, you're, plug, you're, you're giving it to PLD dot scatter, but Y is not uh, not passed to the plot decision surface. So in other words, Y really is Y train over there. Oh, I see. Okay. And so you don't need that. You just need DF So, yeah. Okay. Oops. Well, still not. It got one right. Uh, what's the issue now? Max features. This was working just not too long ago. So it's throwing an error here. I think you can debug this offline. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll um I'll I'll debug this and uh, put up a fresh copy. Um, on GitHub soon. But uh, what I wanted to show you and what you'll see uh, eventually is that uh, these plots sort of show different decision boundaries. So here you'll see this is the, uh, the tree classifier. Um, and, 
and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see the others are kind of, uh, they're very, very different. They're very distinct from one another. So not only do they have very uh, distinct, uh, very different characteristics in terms of how they, uh, they do on prediction, but they also um, uh, have very different, they, they look very different, or they, they make this uh, sort of prediction map very different from one another. Okay. Well, uh, that's all for today, and uh, we'll see you next week.